Adani Group. Adani Group. Adani Group companies continue to slide for a third straight session. Six billion dollars gone in a day. A short seller Hindenburg Research accusing the conglomerate of share price manipulation and fraud. Using shell companies to pump up the stock of Adani Enterprises. The report is a malicious combination of selective misinformation, baseless and discredited allegations. That... India's Adani Group says it's exploring legal action against a US short seller, Hindenburg Research. He says uh, Hindenburg is making an attack not just on the company, he's also making an attack on India and its growth ambitions. The fundamentals of our company are very strong. We will continue to focus on a long-term value creation and growth. In 2022, Jeff Bezos lost his title of the second richest man on earth to Gautam Adani. You might know Adani as the man behind the roaring money-making success of the Indian conglomerate, the notorious Adani Group. The Adani Group, or the Adani Enterprises by the way, has their hands deep in a dozen major companies all over the world. Infrastructure, airport, roads, water management, data centers, mining, oils and foods. There isn't an industry that Adani has left untouched. It's India's largest port operator and into 21 alone reported sales of $9.3 billion. But Adani wasn't a name that people outside of India would have been familiar with. Until Gautam Adani got accused of pulling the biggest corporate con in history. It was a typical morning at the Adani Group head offices when they got hit by the most frightening blow that any corporation fears. After two years of extensive research and digging, Hindenburg Research reported on the company's corporate fraud and stock manipulation. That's one way to kickstart your day. Corporate fraud and stock market whistleblowers are common enemies of MNCs like Adani Group. But Hindenburg isn't your average small-town investigative venture. When a company responsible for devaluing the Nikola stock publishes a public research report on your financials, you simply can't take that lightly. Plus, Hindenburg has a history. Not only it brought down Nikola's stock by 40%, but also convinced the SEC to open an inquiry on the company. The invincible CEO, Trevor Milton, had to resign, and the company is now dead. All of that through a single open domain research paper. Now, when all eyes are on Gautam Adani, the man who shook the US market by surpassing Amazon, you just can't look away. Especially when the research company knows a thing or two about the expose and kill game of the corporate world. So far, both of the parties are out on the legal fronts to prove each other wrong. That bit was expected from the get-go. But as always, there's one side that is taking the most heat from the exposure. Adani Group is trembling under the pressure of serious allegations of corporate fraud and stock market malpractice. By all accounts, the content of the report has hit the group on all fronts. All of its major seven companies are currently being reassessed in the global market share. There's no doubt that the research report is devastating for Adani's market value and the international corporate lobbies they had banked on. The report entails the corporation's network of shell companies and offshore accounts that hold its largest public stock value. For years, the Adani family members have moved money around by defrauding the balance sheets, a financial crime that should delist them from the Indian market. As far as any large-scale corporate fraud goes, there's always a criminal web that has managed to stay undercover from international financial crime agencies. That doesn't mean that whistleblowers can't trace them back to illegal investment flows. In the case of the Adani Group, a big fish like Elara took the bait. With the help of Elara, an offshore fund management company, the coveted Adani accountant was able to concentrate more than 3 billion US dollars for his employers. 3 billion US dollars. When a former employee of Alara was able to cooperate with all of the concealed information, it was obvious that Heidenberg hit a jackpot. That's where the stock market manipulation allegations gain momentum. Hindenburg was able to link the infamous Alara with internationally recognized financial crime fugitive Darmesh Doshi, the notorious king of stock manipulation. Doshi is known to have a close relationship with the Indian master market manipulator, Kitan Parekh. If you're into using your offshore or shell money to wash trade the stock market, Parekh is your go-to guy. Hindenburg reports that both Parekh and Doshi have a knack for rerouting the offshore Adani money to pump in almost 30 to 40% delivery volume in the market. Enough to derail an entire day in the stock market. 
Plus, the network allegedly also has a string of investors that are on a handsome pay grade to pump the Adani Enterprise stock. If all of these allegations are proven true, Gautam Adani is in line for a series of groundbreaking litigation in corporate history. So, what does the report mean for the future of Adani Group? Well, the company is constantly fighting off all the allegations, but against the backdrop of their highly paid legal time, the company is rattled. And that's why Hindenburg maintains that the multinational corporation should ideally count their days as one of the largest conglomerates in the world. In fact, it was a long time coming now. Those are some promising, hard-to-deliver consequences. At the end of the day, a research report is in a tussle against one of the strongest and politically charged MNCs in India. You'd think that the scales were always tipped in the favor of Gautam Adani. This isn't his first rodeo, and probably won't be the last one. What Hindenburg was able to do must have taken the Adani lawyers by surprise. A lot of legitimacy and media attention around the report was able to spook the chief market regulator of India. Enough to open a top priority wide scope investigation against the Adani Group. Securities and Exchange Board of India, or SEBI, isn't just sitting in the corner and waiting for Heidenberg to settle the legal score. The regulatory body is probing into the company's alleged offshore tax havens and stock manipulation practices. There's also a chance that CB will put strong regulatory mechanisms on the Adani Group to protect its investors from any market volatility that the investigation might open. For an Indian homegrown corporation, that's pretty bad news. But the worst was yet to come. Here's the thing. Gautam Adani was in the middle of a planned public share sale when Heidenberg decided to have a field day with the company's stock. Hitting an all-time low, the Adani companies took a 107 billion US dollar hit in February, and it took only 24 hours for the corporation to suffer a colossal market loss. Within the next few hours, Gautam Adani also lost his position in the top 10 richest men of Forbes. But that isn't the biggest concern for the Adanis. Not only did they have to axe their follow-up public offering, but their investors rapidly lost interest and trust in the corporation too. For a multinational corporation as big as this, investors require strong insulation from any systematic risk or financial losses. If they start to pull out their money from the enterprise, the corporation won't be able to keep up with its market share. Since the Adonis have their hands in pretty much every money-making sector in India, we can say Hindenburg hit them right where it hurts. And by all means, it hurts pretty bad. It isn't surprising that the Central Bank of India has alerted the local banks to reassess their exposure to any future financial losses of the conglomerate. Just like Nikola's decline in stock after the Hindenburg publication went live, the Adani group followed suit too. If there's ever a case study about the decline of the Adani lobby in India, its plummeted share price would be highlighted as a strong tipping point. Investors aside, common people who had bought the Adani shares to make some quick cash on the side suffered too. In February, the enterprise's stock was shed by 26.7%. In fact, all of the seven key companies of the conglomerate took some substantial hits in the opening and closing sessions in the wake of the Hindenburg report and it's been going downhill ever since. The chaos surrounding the MNC isn't just limited to the Indian borders. A catastrophe of this scale is widely transnational, if not global. In this case, the Adani Group is a major interest group in global stock indexing. And when you're part of an international system, regulatory bodies like MSCI will constantly revalue or reassess your stock pricing. You have global fund managers to please and invest, an explosive report by Hindenburg Research isn't going to help with that. It wasn't surprising that MSCI was quick to take note of the expose and revalue the stock of four key companies working under the MNC. The agency was quick to reassess the size of the free floats of the Adani companies as the report had created doubts about the credibility of the investors. For a company that has breezed through the stock market shocks, this is a newly curated horrifying experience. What Gautam Adani didn't expect was that a US-based research tank would end up putting them on the international fraud alert list. So it was given that the CEO has started to frame the allegations outside the realm of financial crimes. For the Adani top dog, Hindenburg is a conspiracy against the national interest of India. Even if the investors buy into that rhetoric, the investment research company has some robust evidence of short selling. 
Not to mention, Gautam's lawyers haven't done anything damaging to the whistleblowers. In fact, far from it. And when it comes to the matter of damage control, Adani Group is pretty much losing it. Sure, the corporation was quick to take the services of the most expensive New York firm, Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen and Katz, to sue Hindenburg. No matter what the outcome of the litigation is, the research report is still out there. And it's chaotically killing the Adani business. Enjoyed this video? Give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Okay, now, you've probably heard about someone who became a millionaire by trading Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. The guy you see next to me is the secret Bitcoin billionaire. I found him. There are many who think governments shouldn't exert such tight control over the currency. But of course, at present time, there is no decentralized digital money software or protocols. So there's not really much room for governments to do anything. Meanwhile, the rapid pace of technological advancement has led to the rapid adoption of digital currencies around the world. Since 2015, cryptocurrency has become the subject of much discussion and has experienced tremendous growth. And of course, because of this, cryptocurrency's popularity has skyrocketed. Some of these supporters even consider virtual currencies as a trend of the future. Then again, many don't. Ever since the past few years, cryptocurrency, a revolutionary form of digital currency that is generated by computers following intricate sets of instructions, has emerged as a significant competitor in the field of finance. It challenges the conventional control exercised over traditional fiat currencies, given that it functions on decentralized networks of data ledgers and blockchains. Quite recently, economists provided differing opinions on the implications and potential impact of cryptocurrencies, covering both the positive and negative aspects of this fast-emerging financial phenomenon. These two sides explore the favorable and adverse aspects of this rapidly evolving financial phenomenon, making everyone more attentive when opting for the currency as a whole. On the bright side, though, economists are beginning to recognize the pioneering nature of cryptocurrencies, highlighting the possibility that they could serve as a cleaner and friendlier to the environment alternative to conventional currencies. Unlike fiat currencies, which are established on limited goods such as paper or gold, cryptocurrencies are founded on complicated digital codes, which have no limit to them whatsoever. This then reduces the demand for real resources and creates a financial system that is more environmentally friendly and sustainable. Additionally, economists stress the transparency and accessibility of cryptocurrency data which enables professionals to predict and perhaps avoid economic catastrophe, providing greater stability and predictability than fiat currencies. Interestingly, economists keeping in mind the upcoming trends have warned against the possible hazards and downsides of cryptocurrency. While looking closely at the other side of this coin, they understand and other financial crimes, pushing the society towards the dark end of the alley more. At the same time, it is also possible to follow the goal of cryptocurrency's mainstream adoption, in which the technology moves beyond its current niche status and becomes a vital part of everyday life. Simply envision a world where cryptocurrency payments are as simple and straightforward as credit card payments, whether online, in-store, or peer-to-peer. -peer. Meanwhile, blockchain technology has several potential applications, including improved supply chain management, data security, and more all of which can add to the brighter side of the cryptocurrency future. So in turn, such extensive incorporation has the potential to reimagine our interactions within the financial ecosystem and transform whole sectors, simply because we opted for cryptocurrencies as a whole. Beyond that, of course, naturally, an effective regulatory structure is required given the high level of risk involved. Now, there is much debate among governments on how to regulate cryptocurrency. They might create rules in the future that strike a good balance between encouraging new ideas and protecting consumers from harm. These policies may even pave the way for improved legitimacy and investor confidence in the market by addressing problems including fraud, money laundering, and tax evasion. As a result, both newbies and seasoned veterans of the crypto sector 
would benefit from a well-defined set of rules for navigating this dynamic landscaping one. Imagine it's a new day and you've just woken up. You're in your new apartment, which you're only able to afford because of your amazing job at Google. That reminds you, in a few hours, you have to get to work. You've put years of work into getting a computer science degree and working out the skills to get this job, but you've made it and life's finally good. But then you check your email and you see those four words that bring everything crashing down around you. We're letting you go. This was the reality of over 150,000 people who have been laid off over the last four months from both tech giants like Amazon, Netflix, Google, and Twitter, as well as smaller tech startups and firms. So, what's going on? Has the tech bubble finally burst? Is having a tech degree no longer worth as much as it did five years ago? Most importantly, what do these changes mean for you? Let's get right into it. The statistics. We all heard about Elon Musk firing about half of the employees at Twitter as soon as he got hold of the company. Well, it turns out that wasn't a one-time thing. Because pretty much every big tech company you can think of has been going the same. Before we get into the reason behind the companies deciding to reduce their workforces, we have to look at just how many people have been laid off. The biggest layoff was by Alphabet, Google's parent company, which announced on the 21st of January that it was letting go about 12,000 of its employees. That's a huge number and made up about 6% of its workforce. But the other tech giants were not going to be left behind. In November, Meta announced that it would be letting go of about 11,000 people, which made up 13% of the company. Similarly, Microsoft let go about 10,000 people in January, and Amazon has reduced its workforce by about 1,800 people since November. Layoffs happen, but not this rapidly, and with so many big companies carrying them out at the same time, it's led people to ask, what exactly is the reason behind all of this? Well, there's not just one thing, but let's get the most obvious stuff out of the way first. Overhiring. Back when the pandemic was going on, most companies had hired a lot more employees than they needed. It was an amazing time to be in the tech field. Everywhere, you could hear stories of big salaries and lavish perks. As the competition for top talent went on, people were getting their dream jobs. Program managers at Apple were making anywhere between $120,000 to $230,000, while mid-career software engineers at Google were making about $120,000 to just under $200,000 a year. But this level of growth just wasn't sustainable. The average time most of these laid-off employees were at their jobs was about two years. Basically, most of the people hired during the pandemic are being let go. For most companies, the economic reality of today is a lot different than what they thought it was going to be about two years ago. So when the pandemic ended and the demand for online services went down, all of a sudden this many employees simply weren't needed anymore. CEOs have put out statements claiming hiring rates during the pandemic simply did not match up with the loss of demand for online services when the world opened up again. And who can blame them? If we look at the statistics, then their decision makes sense. The stock market value of companies like Netflix and Zoom multiplied by as much as three times from the start of the pandemic to its peak in August 2021. By September 2022, it had fallen by about 80% for all of them. Most of these companies are doing their best to cut back their losses. The two fields that took the brunt of the cuts were the software engineers working for Google and Twitter, and HR at Microsoft and Meta. The reduction of the HR department makes sense. If the companies are going to be hiring fewer people, then there's less need for people in human resources posts. But there's another reason behind it, and it might be scarier than you think. Aye. HR is an area where a lot of functions are being automated. Instead of spending money on employees, companies like Amazon have been using AI to not only identify low-performing staff and fire them, but also to help with interviews and do tasks like checking references, carrying out health and safety tests, and verifying identities. Artificial intelligence is coming for people's jobs. And while we're on the topic of AI, let's talk about the other big problem. ChatGPT has changed the landscape. Since November, this new AI chatbot has taken over everyone's lives. Some people have even predicted that by 2025, it will be everyone's primary mode of research. People prefer its concise, human-like answers rather than Google's methods of presenting users with a list of internet pages. Google, obviously, can't let that happen. 
Its CEO, Sundar Pakai, has said that the strategy after making the layoffs will be to direct the brainpower to AI. Most of Google's job cuts have been at Area 120, its in-house incubator for new projects. Most of its experimental projects are being cut out, and all that money is going toward artificial intelligence instead. So in the next few months, Google might be presenting its own answer to ChatGPT. It's not the only company doing this, though. Right next to its report that the company was laying off 10,000 people, Microsoft also announced that it was going to invest $10 billion into OpenAI, which is the company that created ChatGPT. This means that for every one person laid off by Microsoft, the company is investing about $1 million into AI. But why are we talking about money? After all, it's not like these huge companies need to worry about it, right? Well, don't be so sure. The money issue. We've already talked about how Netflix and Zoom stock prices have fallen a lot as soon as the pandemic ended, but there's a lot more going on behind the scenes than you might think. The companies are losing more money than they're comfortable with. For example, following a lockdown-related disruption to iPhone production in China, Apple's share price fell by 27%. Similarly, Tesla has been facing issues in China, which is the source of 40% of its sales and has been forced to lower the prices of Model 3 and Model Y. With the world expected to hit a recession, there's just not as much demand for the products anymore. Last year, Tesla reduced its workforce by a hopping 10%, and it's expected to do so again in the first quarter of this year. As for Meta and TikTok, they're facing a similar problem. Most of the revenue for these companies comes from ads. For Meta, ads made up 98% of the total profit in 2022. With the recession creeping up on most of the world, they'll be losing a large part of this. On top of that, with Apple allowing users to opt out of data tracking for advertisers, there's an even bigger blow to their ad revenues. And Twitter. Twitter has it the worst of all. Ever since Elon Musk bought the company, ad revenue has fallen by an absurd 40%. On top of that, the company has made a loss for the past 10 out of 12 years, and it's now $13 billion in debt. Long story short, there isn't just one reason why so many people are being let go. But what does this mean for them? Where will the employees go from here? And just as importantly, has the tech bubble finally burst as it did back in the 2000s? The future. Most of the people who have lost their jobs have not started looking for new employment. We can't say for sure right now, but it may mean that most people are now looking towards the freelance sector to pay their bills rather than big tech. As far as the tech bubble goes, it hasn't crashed as much as come down to earth. These layoffs have been because of a mix of reasons from expanding too fast to the changes in the global economy and even the changing role between humans and AI and the future of technology. Big tech companies cutting down on jobs doesn't the jobs don't exist. After all, the whole world still needs software engineers. For most people, these changes just mean that they'll be working in fields like healthcare and defense instead. Tech isn't going anywhere. What do you think about the recent layoffs by tech giant companies? What will the career paths for future software engineers and computer scientists be? Let us know in the comments below, and if you like this video, Make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for the next video. ChatGPT is here to stay. And by the looks of it, it's going to beat Google at its own game. Or games, should we say. Like in the game of most optimized search results, both Google Search and ChatGPT were pulling in the ropes and it got more heated up when an unlikely contender entered the ring. Microsoft's investment in ChatGPT has triggered the modern AI war among big tech companies. AI chatbots, billions of dollars, and some calculated tech movies. This is the story of Google versus Microsoft. Ever since the inception of Chrome and Google search engine, Microsoft's Bing and Edge are essentially obsolete. And that makes a lot of sense. Bing, in particular, has a weaker search optimization than Google. But what if Microsoft flips that around? Sure, you don't imagine yourself willingly using Bing over Google, but that doesn't mean you can't be incentivized. The hottest rumor on the block says it will take Microsoft a hefty sum of $10 billion to flip the odds. And its wildcard is none other than OpenAI's wunderkind ChatGPT. Ever heard of how facts don't care about your feelings? That's exactly the case with the popular AI chatbot. The newest AI tech isn't everyone's quintessential blessing in disguise. 
If your future depends on your writing skills or pursuing an MBA, you know you have been defeated by an AI chatbot. There's hardly any going back. On the other hand, ChatGPT is the messiah of saving human capital from menial jobs that don't warrant your effort. And as dystopian as it may sound, people are finding ChatGPT as their friend of the hour. After all, it only responds when you prompt it and can be shut down within seconds. By all accounts, it's not a bad conversationalist and a listener. All things considered, the world is still deciding upon their feelings towards the AI chatbot. While many of us are in our buffer zone, Microsoft recognized the durability of the AI tech. What you don't know is that the big tech company had already extended its support to OpenAI back in 2019 and 2021. So they were just waiting for the company to roll out the tech and gauge its usefulness or efficiency. But now, both of the companies have made their partnership official. That's just a typical way to say that Microsoft is investing $10 billion in ChatGPT's parent company, OpenAI. This particular figure means everything for the AI tech battle in the mainstream. Plus, Microsoft has advertised its cloud computing platform Azure under a very similar banner. The company's ambition to turn Azure into an AI supercomputer isn't something new. We've heard all about it because somehow it's the company's big saving grace. But that's not the only tangent here. A new AI supercomputer sounds like bad news if you work in creative industries. Who would want a better big bad boy version of ChatGPT on the loose? For better or worse, Azure is an important player in the AI tech wars. Since it provides the exclusive computing infrastructure to all OpenAI projects, Microsoft has plans to turn its AI computer into an invincible machine. And if it gets its hands on an AI toolchain that's objectively better than Google, the tech market share might change drastically. That's the very pinnacle of the AI tech wars. The first blow to Google could come at the expense of its browser and search engine. We know that you aren't changing your default browser anytime soon. And why would you? It takes three seconds for Bing to derail your entire process of searching for something super basic. Google has that keyword optimization in its bag. But with Microsoft putting an influx of money into OpenAI, the company is going to make substantial changes. One of them is the plan to integrate both Edge and Bing with ChatGPT to yield high-precision search results. If this plan follows through, it can revolutionize the search engine space to no end. Yet the matters aren't just about search engines and web browsers. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Microsoft's investment in OpenAI has opened a new chapter of who gets to monopolize the user-friendly AI tech. For years, both Google and Amazon have had their fair share of trial and error in this space. With Google Assistant and Alexa, we got a glimpse of what AI looks like in our daily lives. But for Google, the time for trial and error is officially over. Not only do they have a chip on their shoulder with their recent AI snafu, but also Microsoft hasn't been this cutthroat with competition ever. We talk about Google's AI snafu in a bit, Let's lay out some important clarifications before we move on. Google's AI system hardly generates profits for Alphabet. Sure, it's there and owns 24% of the total population's market share in its avenue, but that's all it does. It boasts a weakly monetized market share that's also lesser than Alexa and Siri. Again, this isn't surprising. You can't expect Google Assistant to run an advertisement on the newest Nike when it's spitting instructions on life-saving CPR. That's one dilemma for all AI systems. How do you create space to run advertisements efficiently? Google hasn't cracked the code yet. From what we know, Microsoft is in the process of figuring out that big money-making question too. So far, it has run the ChatGPT premium model, but it's too early to comment if it's a big W or a weak shot in the dark. To be fair, Google wasn't exactly feeling bothered by its AI assistant not bringing any money to Alphabet. For them, it was a matter of making the AI tech space as anti-competitive as it gets. You know the typical make tech, monetize it later policy that works out for the company. ChatGPT derailed those plans pretty badly. And it was obvious that Alphabet is rattled. Doesn't take a genius to figure that out as the company hastily announced its plans for an AI chatbot right after Microsoft. The newest feather in Google's hat is called Bard. And the tech has already cost Google a spectacular amount of $160 billion. This saga of an epic failure starts with an unlikely player in the AI game. It's actually the new James Weber telescope that took Google's fortune in a huge market value showdown. 
Alphabet had advertised BARD as a launchpad for curiosity and a search tool to help simplify complex topics before everything went down the drain. In the highly anticipated launch event, the AI chatbot inaccurately pointed out that the James Webber telescope had discovered the exoplanets for NASA. Just not that. Apparently, the $10 billion space telescope was also monumental in taking the first ever pictures of exoplanets. Much to Google's disappointment, not only that is factually incorrect, but chronologically disruptive too. NASA has pictures of exoplanets dating back to 2004. Typically, any human would say, oops, my bad, and move on from this elementary mistake. But not when you're the upcoming prodigal child of a highly competitive big tech company. And especially not when your parent company is looking to make a big, bold statement in front of its billion-dollar investors. The important tipping point here is simple and robust. If Google wants to win this AI space race, it can't afford to lose money like this. Not when surfing the internet is going to cost an extra few bucks. And why's that? Consider how Google operates differently than ChatGPT. If you're going to search describe the main events of World War I on Google, the search engine is going to rely on its index that categorizes and prioritizes the most relevant web links. It's further going to rank them on your browser depending on the search engine optimization and sensitivity of the keywords such as main events and World War I. Sounds like a pretty complicated process, yet it takes less than a second. On the flip side, ChatGPT takes more than a second to generate results for the same query, but you aren't vetting out information. It's right in front of you and you can choose to engage with it if you want more info or clarifications. Without any doubt, that's a far more useful process. But also, it's a costly affair. Using an AI chatbot as a search engine costs 10 times more than using Google. The processing time is higher and the information is far more sensitive to your original query. This particular issue isn't just exclusive to Alphabet. Both Google or Microsoft aren't the good Samaritans of AI tech. How exactly they tackle the hefty costs of processing is the most pressing concern. The big tech companies aren't blind to the issue either. For instance, Google is now changing its strategy to reevaluate the computing scale of BARD. In all likelihood, it's not going to be a highly optimized and detailed-oriented AI chatbot initially. In this AI war, it's hard to ignore the charisma around ChatGPT. It has more or less identified its efficiency issues when BARD is just getting started. Sure, Microsoft's search engine revenue is nowhere near what Google racks. But with ChatGPT, Microsoft is in the position of gaining $2 billion in ad revenue if Google keeps losing percentage points in the market value. If that's not a masterclass of a move, then what is? Thank you for watching this video. If you're interested in the hottest tech deets of our time, subscribe to our channel for more content like this. Welcome back to the world of Taiwanese semiconductor factories. In our previous video, we talked about the fascinating history, secrecy, and innovation of these factories. But in this video, we'll delve into a more pressing issue, the chip shortage. It's like the world has suddenly run out of its essential fuel, and everyone's feeling the pinch. So join us as we try to uncover the mystery behind the chip shortage and its impact on our daily lives. It all began back in the times of COVID-19. When the pandemic first hit, the world was thrown into chaos. Suddenly, many people were forced to work or study from home, and the demand for laptops, tablets, and other devices skyrocketed. This surge in demand created a corresponding increase in demand for semiconductors, the tiny chips that power these devices. However, as the pandemic swept across the globe, many industries were forced to shut down or reduce production. This caused a ripple effect through the supply chain, with factories in Asia shutting down or reducing production, creating a shortage of semiconductors to meet the growing demand. Enter Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, aka the TSMC, one of the biggest players in the semiconductor industry. TSMC produces chips for some of the world's largest tech companies, including Apple, Nvidia, and Qualcomm. But even TSMC found it difficult to keep up with the sudden surge in demand caused by the pandemic. As a result, TSMC and other semiconductor manufacturers were forced to prioritize their customers, which led to some companies receiving more chips than others. This, in turn, caused a ripple effect throughout the supply chain, with some industries being hit harder than others. But COVID-19 was not the only calamity that affected the world of semiconductors. Another major reason behind the shortage is the unexpected drought that hit Taiwan in 2021. A major player in the semiconductor industry, 
It has been the worst on record in the past 50 years, with severe consequences for both the environment and the economy. The lack of rainfall has caused water levels in reservoirs to drop to dangerously low levels, with many of its reservoirs at less than 20% capacity and some falling below 10%. This has led to water rationing, with households and businesses forced to cut back on usage. It's not just any drought. It has caused a water war between chip manufacturers and locals. Imagine chip factories having to compete with farmers for access to water. Who would have thought that the future of electronics would depend on a reliable water supply? TSMC, the world's largest contract chip maker, uses over 150,000 tons of water per day, which is about 80 standard swimming pools. That's a lot of water, and it's only for one company. Due to the drought, TSMC and other semiconductor manufacturers have been relying on water trucks to maintain production. It's estimated that TSMC has spent over NT $0.5 billion on water trucks, which exceeded their original budget planning. But it's not just about the shortage of microchips, it's also about climate change. Taiwan is at a high climate risk, and the research predicts that the exposure to water shortage in North Taiwan, which includes Taipei and Taoyuan, the most populated metropolitan area, will increase dramatically due to climate change. Climate model projections show that both typhoons and spring rainfall are likely to decrease with climate change, which means that the production of microchips may become even more challenging in the future. Despite the challenges, TSMC and other chip companies have been working to increase their process water recycling ratio. TSMC's water recycling ratio was around 87% between 2015 and 2019, but total water consumption still increased by 70%. This shows that there is a need for a more sustainable and efficient way of producing semiconductors. The consequences of the chip shortage are dire. Imagine going through your day without any access to technology. No phones, no laptops, no cars, no planes, no smart homes, no internet. Sounds like a nightmare, doesn't it? Well, the shortage of microchips in Taiwan could make that a reality. One of the industries hit hardest by the semiconductor shortage is the automotive industry. It's not just your computer or phone that depends on these little electronic wonders. It's your car, too. Yes, you heard that right. Even a $50,000 car has hundreds of chips in it. And that number is set to grow to over 1,500 in the coming years, as vehicles become more autonomous. They rely on dozens of semiconductors to power everything from infotainment systems to safety features. As a result, many automakers have been forced to shut down production lines and delay the releases of new models. But it's not just the automotive industry that has been affected. Even ASML, the world's largest maker of lithography scanners used to make chips, has suffered from chip shortages. Imagine that! Even the guys who make the machines that make the chips can't get their hands on enough chips. The problem is not just limited to cars and lithography scanners. The market for semiconductor manufacturing tools is enormous and multifaceted. If TSMC cannot get the machines they need on time, their fab will stand idle. Ultimately, other suppliers of fab tools as well as TSMC's customers will suffer. So supply chain management will be even more crucial tomorrow than it is today. The snowballing demand for semiconductors will ultimately lead to an increase in their prices, which will affect the prices of actual goods too. Meanwhile, logistics is getting more complicated, which will also affect pricing. All in all, electronics are going to get more sophisticated, but also more expensive in the coming years. There's more to it. Political tensions and conflicts are also playing a role. The ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine has disrupted chip production in Eastern Europe, while the trade war between China and the US has affected the global supply chain. Inside TSMC, the Taiwanese chip-making giant that's building a new plant in Phoenix, executives are closely monitoring these developments and their potential impact on the industry. However, that's a story for another time. Indonesia is one of the only countries in the world whose economy grew by more than 5% in 2022. Indonesia has set a growth target of 5.3% next year as the economy continues to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. I think the fourth most um, likely place for investment over the next several years amongst emerging markets. To the international front, the global equity slipped slightly today, but we're still set for a weekly gain. How did a country that had the first democratic presidential election in its history in 2004 transform into an economic powerhouse. This is a story of authoritarianism, corruption, revival, and what we can all learn from it. The Indonesian economic miracle. Like most territories with an abundance of natural resources, 
the archipelago of Indonesia was once a Dutch colony, before a guy with only one name, Sukarno, and his friend named Mohammed Hatta, proclaimed its independence following World War II. While this should have been a cause for celebration, the good times were short-lived, as Sukarno quickly installed a brutal and authoritarian communist regime, the PKLI, that lasted for over 20 years, until a military coup led by another guy with only one name, General Suharto overthrew it in 1965. We can trace the beginning of Indonesia's economic ascent to this Sukarno and Suharto beef. Unlike his communist predecessor Suharto, who was officially appointed president in 1968, welcomed foreign investment into the country, and this began the gradual process of shifting its economy away from one dominated by subsistence agriculture to industrialization and urbanization. Over the next three decades, GDP rose by an average rate of 7% per year, and the official poverty rate fell from 60% to 15% during this time period. Indonesia had arrived until the Asian financial crisis hit the country hard in 1997. At one point in 1998, the inflation rate was 78% and the Jakarta Stock Exchange crashed, causing widespread riots throughout the country and ultimately the resignation of President Suharto after 30 years of rule. But the country had a few things going for it that enabled it to emerge from this brief period of instability better than ever before. Drivers of Indonesian success 1. Natural resources We have already mentioned Indonesia's abundant natural resources, from palm oil to timber, to delicious coconuts, and so much more. These form the foundation of the country's economic success. Together, agriculture and mining account for nearly a quarter of the country's economic output. The most of any sector. 2. Manufacturing A sign of a genuinely healthy, self-sustaining economy is how many things it makes and exports compared to how many things it imports. By this measure, Indonesia's trade surplus, the amount by which exports exceed imports, hit a fresh record last year of more than $50 billion on the back of high commodity prices. Kesson, a trade ministry spokesperson with one name, like the country's former presidents, said another surplus is expected this year. Indonesia is also a top 15 auto parts manufacturer, in particular, motorcycle parts. Upon learning that motorbikes are the most popular mode of transport in the country, with a whopping 85% of all households owning at least one two-wheel form of transportation, this makes a lot of sense. 3. Infrastructure All of this is only possible with consistent investment in roads, railways, and ports that have taken place over the past few decades. The current administration of Joko Joko Widodo has increased annual infrastructure spending nearly every year since he took office in 2014. This has enabled the next success driver, tourism. 4. Tourism With an abundance of beaches, a bustling urban center infrastructure, and warm weather year-round, Indonesia is on a lot of preferred destination lists. Although it accounts for only about 5% of GDP in any given year, a figure that is lower than most of its G20 counterparts, tourism is a growth sector for the country, as remote work continues to take off and its comparatively low cost of living is experienced firsthand. Before we mention the last driver of success, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button and turn on notifications if you want to know when we release the next video that you can learn something from. 5. Entrepreneurship Nearly 60% of Indonesia's population now lives in urban centers. This means mobile internet use and an abundance of modern services have proliferated thanks to what TechCrunch has called a burgeoning startup economy. A healthy amount of venture capital investment totaling over 4 billion US dollars in 2022 alone has made this possible. While most of this is going into tech-enabled businesses in and around the capital of Jakarta, startups based in secondary cities like Semarang and Maiden that are attempting to make everyday things like farming and transportation easier, 
are beginning to get noticed, ensuring that the country's startup ecosystem will continue to grow. Lessons for the world. Indonesia has come a long way since it was a Japanese-occupied territory in World War II. Other countries would do well to heed some of the lessons of its rise, such as sustainable growth. The Southeast Asian nation hasn't pursued a growth at any cost model, and it shows. Although its national debt has steadily been growing each year for the past decade, Indonesia's debt to GDP currently stands at just over 40%, pitting it firmly in the bracket of the world's least indebted countries. On the other hand, steady investment in infrastructure and the maintenance of a solid manufacturing base has given it the third highest GDP growth rate in the world, behind only far less developed nations like Namibia and Botswana. Mutually beneficial partnerships. As an exporting nation, whose value of goods exported exceeds the value of goods imported. Indonesia has far more positive than negative trade balances with its trade partners. This ensures the country gets more or as much as it gives. Foreign investment. Indonesia has been open for investments since the 70s under the presidency of Suharto, but by consistently investing in itself and building up its economy since that time, it has become infinitely more attractive to investors over the last 10 to 20 years. Today, it takes in more than $40 billion in foreign direct investment annually. Just like a business that has gradually built up a brand name for itself over a long period of time and now regularly receives investment proposals that it can turn down if it doesn't like the terms. The country has become a household name and everyone loves a winner. Indonesia is a winner on the world stage. Boris Johnson's future looks bleak. But I don't think it's even just... Then you can think that... What would you look for through today's... Dominate at the end of the day. Get ready to delve into the looming economic crisis that threatens the world. Many economists are predicting widespread economic collapse, and the rising rates of inflation are certainly not helping. Join us as we find out how this might be the biggest economic collapse. First, let us look at the state of the global economy. At the World Economic Forum in Davos, economists painted a grim picture, with a staggering two-thirds of them predicting a global economic downturn in 2023. The World Bank echoes this sentiment and warns that we're standing on the brink of an economic crisis. But wait, there's a glimmer of hope. The International Monetary Fund, or the IMF, offered a more positive perspective, suggesting that we may dodge a recession after all. However, the IMF did issue a cautionary note for the United Kingdom, predicting that their economy will shrink. And for the United States, the IMF indicated that it has only a narrow path to avoid the same fate. But what is pushing us towards economic doomsday? The IMF, the World Bank, and a horde of experts all have their eyes on a single factor that could send us all crashing into a recession the drastic interest rate hikes imposed by central banks in a desperate attempt to tame the surging inflation. Central banks have the primary role of achieving price stability by controlling the amount of money and credit available in the economy through the interest rate. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they lowered interest rates to encourage borrowing and stimulate economic activity. This move was meant to act like an adrenaline shot. But as economies reopened and spending increased, inflation rates rose to unprecedented levels. To prevent a catastrophic economic collapse, central banks tightened their monetary policy and raised interest rates to slow down borrowing and control inflation. And now the interest rates have gone through the roof. In early 2022, the US Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank hit the brakes on the economy by raising interest rates. Since then, the US Fed has jacked up rates by a whopping 4.5 percentage points, with the most recent hike on February 1, 2023. Meanwhile, the European Central Bank has hiked rates by 2.5 percentage points. But these hikes pale in comparison to Brazil's sharp increase of 11.75 percentage points since March 2021 and Sri Lanka's rise of 10 percentage points. Why the sudden change in interest rates, you ask? Well, central banks are trying to control inflation by reducing consumer demand. 
The idea is that if people hold off on making big purchases like a new car or a vacation, the prices of these goods and services won't rise as quickly. However, this approach is like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It ends up affecting everyone by increasing the cost of money for both households and businesses. Despite the bluntness of this monetary policy tool, it does appear to be working in some countries. In the US, for example, Inflation has come down significantly from a four-decade high of 9.1% in June 2022 to 6.5% in December. But the story doesn't end there and certainly does not get better. Interest rate hikes have ominous consequences for the economy. As the cost of borrowing goes up, companies are forced to put the brakes on investments and reduce their workforce. The workers that drive the economy are left with no choice but to swallow this bitter pill. As prices continue to rise, people demand better wages. Higher wages are a positive sign for individuals, but it creates a ripple effect that feeds into expenses for companies. To compensate for the increased cost of production, firms increase prices, which then spirals into a negative feedback loop that's enough to put Sharknado to shame. Central banks around the world are fighting tooth and nail to break this spiral and keep the economy afloat. But fear not, Europe has found a way to tackle inflation without tipping the scales into recession. It's a tricky game of balancing the scales, managing inflation without sacrificing economic growth. It may be a painful exercise, but it's essential to avoid a catastrophic economic collapse. But all hope is not lost. Central banks have more tools up their sleeves than even Inspector Gadget to tackle inflation and soften the economic blow. They can use a range of tactics, from adjusting interest rates to managing the money supply and implementing fiscal policy measures like taxation and government spending. But finding the right balance is like trying to wield the Infinity Stones. It requires a delicate touch and a great deal of finesse. The 2023 recession is already bearing an uncomfortable resemblance to the 1981A2 inflation crisis, which sent shivers down the spines of investors worldwide. But unlike the 2008 recession, which was caused by the housing market collapse this time around, inflation is the culprit. But don't panic just yet. The road ahead may be bumpy, but with effective policy measures, smart investments, and a bit of luck, we can weather this storm and emerge stronger than ever. Just take a casual walk down any major city in America and you will find yourself admiring the many luxury cars racing up and down the freeway. Makes you want to buy one for yourself, doesn't it? That is exactly what banks and dealerships exploit, resulting in debt worth millions. Basic economics teaches us the concept of needs and wants. Still, many people struggle to grasp this concept and indulge themselves in loans just to fulfill their wants. And while it does give you short-term happiness, in the long run, the resultant debt really hurts you. Speaking of which, in this video, we will discuss how the American car debt is exploding higher. Without further ado, let us begin. Current Issues and Problems The American car debt issue is not something that suddenly sprung up and became a national issue. It has been on the rise in the United States for the better part of two decades. Before we understand how it has impacted America as an economy, let us look at some statistics. According to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Americans owe an astounding $1.4 trillion as car debt. Now that is huge, considering it amounts to nearly 10% of total consumer debt. In fact, auto debt surpassed credit card debt way back in 2011. Such alarming statistics are nothing when you look at the ground reality of the whole issue. Did you know that large numbers of people are 60 days or more behind on their auto loan payments and many are also dealing with negative equity. But that is just the start of the many problems associated with American car debt. Like, for example, we have a rise in the popularity of 90-month auto loans. These are schemes that, due to the length of the loan taken, attract people as it will on paper result in a low monthly payment. But when you look at the bigger picture, savings may be eclipsed by the huge interest costs. This practice has serious repercussions as it may reduce borrowers' liquidity and cause them financial hardship. Moreover, this issue has also worsened due to the increasing number of subprime borrowers who are able to secure auto loans. Since these borrowers are not ideally placed to pay off these loans, it results in even more debt. And if that was not enough, did you know that due to the shortage of vehicles caused by the pandemic, 
dealerships are increasing their markups significantly. As a result, purchasers can no longer afford cars at their previous price points, and many are opting for longer loan terms and larger monthly payments. This further increases the interest that needs to be paid, further increasing car debt. Effect on consumers We have talked in depth about the various reasons that have led to the increasing car debt. Now let us talk about its implications for the main party affected, the consumers. As you can imagine, consumers have to deal with a lot of issues as a result of car debts. Like for example, when they cannot pay off their monthly charges, their credit scores take a hit making it harder for them to get new lines of credit or better interest rates on existing loans. But that is not all. The stress that comes with these payments can be quite exhausting. In fact, this stress can have a ripple effect on personal finances, reducing discretionary income and increasing savings rates. There have also been extreme examples of some borrowers who may have to choose auto payments over food or rent as a result of rising car prices and interest rates. This clearly shows how the increasing car debt is becoming a major problem. Solutions So, with all these underlying issues and their resultant effects, what can we as consumers do? No, you shouldn't quit taking auto loans altogether because it is a good tool if used properly. What you should do is watch interest rates and vehicle prices so you may buy at the best possible time. In fact, I have the perfect tool that would help you determine whether you should take that loan for financing a new car or not. Heard of the 204010 rule? It basically states if you want to finance your car via a loan, you should be able to afford 20% of the down payment on a car and for the monthly cost to be less than 10% of your monthly income when a loan of four or fewer years is used. This way you can feasibly use these loans to your maximum advantage. Secondly, evaluate your financial situation and look into several forms of credit to see which rates and terms work best with your budget. Keeping that in mind, try to avoid taking out loans with extremely long terms, like the 90-month auto loan I mentioned. These are like cancer, so steer clear of them. Thirdly, be careful with your auto loans. Just follow the basics, like you should be careful of the penalties for not making payments. Trust me, these fines are just pointless money waste. Do not overlook them. I hope that clears everything on the American car debt. If you are also stuck in car debt, I suggest you follow all that was discussed in this video. Other than that, I can only wish you good luck. That is a wrap on the video. Like and subscribe to the channel. And if you like this one, you would surely love our video about cryptocurrency. Do consider watching it. And as always, if you have any queries in regard to America's car debt, do let us know in the comments down below. The parallels between the US and China's real estate markets are in a word, alarming. From the disproportionate amount each contributes to their national economy, show figures of 20% of GDP for US and 25% for China to their dwindling middle classes due to lack of affordability, and the most troubling thing of all, rapid government intervention. Throughout history, real estate has been an economic engine and the downfall of both. Overspeculation, bubbles, and the increasing possibility of a global domino effect. This is why US real estate is headed for a Chinese-style collapse. Behind China's real estate crash, the three red lines, the Middle Kingdom's property sector woes can be traced back to one thing, debt. Leverage, liability, obligation, whatever word you use to describe it. It has been the downfall of many countries and empires. Prior to 2020, China's largest property developers like the infamous Evergrande Group, Wanda Group, and Fantasia Holdings went on a debt binge, developing more residential apartments than there were people who could afford them and aggressively expanding into unrelated businesses like wealth management, electric vehicles, and even professional soccer. Something had to give and in 2021, the largest of these property developers, Evergrande Group came close to a Lehman Brothers style collapse when it defaulted on billions of dollars worth of debt. Interest payments were reportedly later made after the deadline had passed, but the damage had already been done. The Chinese government's three red lines rule was created in response to regulate the leverage taken on by developers, limiting their borrowing based on their debt-to-cash, debt-to-equity, and debt-to-assets ratios. Property developers continue to struggle under the weight of this rule to this day and recent statistics 
show that things are about to get a lot worse before they get better. The current U.S. real estate landscape. Will prices ever go down? One of the best ways to describe the U.S. real estate market today in three words or less is detached from reality. How else could you explain a median home price of $416,000 as of the second quarter of 2023, down 3% from the first quarter, against a median income of just over $50,000, with a record $17 trillion in household debt? The only way this has been possible is due to a zero interest rate policy by the Federal Reserve and trillions of dollars worth of debt. But just as easily as the Fed helped inflate the current real estate bubble, and the one prior to it, the Fed is helping to burst it. By raising interest rates at the fastest pace since the 80s, it is driving up monthly mortgage payments on millions of adjustable rate mortgages, from commercial real estate to single-family homes. Predictably, this has started a wave of defaults on everyone from hotel or EITs to institutional real estate investors. With sales activity slowing and the Fed raising rates again by a quarter point last month while hinting at yet more rate hikes to come, the real estate market's days of consistent price appreciation have come to an end. Similarities and differences between the U.S. and China's real estate markets while there are no ghost cities consisting of hundreds of empty apartment blocks lining rural parts of Georgia and South Carolina, the similarities between the U.S. and China's real estate markets are closer than one may think. For starters, rampant speculation driven by easy credit has created an artificially high demand for both new and existing homes in both countries. In so-called Tier 1 cities like Beijing and Shanghai in China, homes cost around 14 times the average salary. If you want to buy a home in Los Angeles today, it will cost you more than 18 times the average national salary. The second stark similarity is the demonstrated preference for government intervention over market economics in both the U.S. and China. Centralized interest rates, implicit rather than explicit price support, and bailouts over defaults have created the unsustainable, inorganic price growth we've experienced over the past decade. Sure, there are also key differences such as 70-year property leaseholds in China, compared to permanent property rights in the U.S. high property taxes in the States versus little to no property taxes in China, and a transparent housing market via the MLS database against a closed one in China with no single source of reliable housing data. However, these differences have had less of an overall impact on each respective market than their similarities have. Navigating the storm ahead, why U.S. real estate is headed for a Chinese-style collapse. After the longest property bull market in U.S. history with consistent price appreciation since 2012, home values finally started declining at the end of 2022, according to the Sam case Schiller Home Price Index. The current cycle of over-indebtedness, combined with steadily higher interest rates, will tip the market over if it is not reversed. There are also some other potential catalysts lurking around the corner. Hello commercial real estate. By definition, a bubble has three stages. Price growth driven by speculation. Credit expansion. Popping of the bubble. Having gone through the first two for the past decade plus, we are now entering the third and final stage. Hold on to your iPhones, it could be a bumpy ride. There's no question that the Fed will step in and intervene just like their People's Bank of China counterpart attempting to prop up prices like in 2009. Only this time it likely won't succeed. After revving up the money printer to the tune of more than $10 trillion in 2020, 80% of all dollars ever in existence. It may be out of paper bullets to save the market this time around, meaning there may be no bottom to how low it can and will go.